Welcome to NCIX Tech Tips. In today's episode, we have the all new GeForce GTX 660 Ti. This is the Kepler architecture at a price point that enthusiast gamers will find a little bit easier to swallow than the previous GTX 670 and 680, but with most of the performance of those previous cards. <laughs> Now the GTX 660 Ti is a particularly exciting video card because in previous generations we saw a 580 and a 570 that used a different GPU from the 560 Ti. Same thing with the 480 and the 470 and the 460. Totally different GPU, the same general architecture but cut down in a big way. This time around we're seeing a GTX 660 Ti that is slightly more expensive than we've seen for this sort of tier of card in the past, but performs dramatically better and uses the same architecture as the GTX 670 and 680. In fact, it is running at the same clock speeds with the same number of CUDA cores as the GTX 670. The only difference is that the memory interface has been cut down from 256-bit to 192-bit, which, don't worry guys, has not affected the ability of the card to run even numbers of memory. So you can buy a two gig GTX 660 Ti. You're not limited to weird, you know, one and a half gig configurations like we've seen on previous generation cards. So what is this card? It has a little bit less memory bandwidth, but it's otherwise pretty much a 670. So let's see what kind of performance we can get out of it. Now the positioning in this card is pretty unique because it is two steps under a GTX 680, which is the flagship Kepler video card with the single GPU. There's also the 690 with two. It is one step under the GTX 670 and it is significantly less expensive than both of those cards. So while the 680 comes in at 500 bucks and the 670 is 400 bucks, the 660 Ti is gonna come in at around $300, which puts it kind of in between the 7870 and the 7950, which I have one each of, here and here. So where does the performance fall? Well, what you guys will be happy to find out is that the performance of a stock GTX 660 Ti, or Ti if you prefer, is actually closer to a 7950 than it is to a 7870, which means it's running with the big dogs from the AMD camp in spite of the lower price point and the, well, the lower price point. At launch with the 660 Ti, you're going to have tons of different options. So you can go with a reference card, which will use a very similar PCB design and cooler to the GTX 670, which should tell you a little something about the pedigree of the 660 Ti, if I haven't already told you enough. Which means you'll have that half-length PCB with a blower cooler that exhausts air out the back of the case. The advantage of the blower cooler is that you do exhaust the hot air out of the case, but it doesn't keep the GPU or the GPU components as cool as something like, say, perhaps the dual fan custom cooler on this Galaxy GC Edition card. This one performed significantly better than any reference cooler I've seen in the past as well as even the Twin Frozer 4 cooler on our MSI Power Edition 660 Ti. We're talking like six, seven degrees better under load, which is outstanding without being that much louder. Now, the disadvantage of the Galaxy card is the fact that it does not support overvolting the GPU. You can still get a pretty significant overclock out of it, but not quite as much as if you could turn up the voltages. It just means what you get is a very cool looking, very cool running GeForce 660 Ti that is also built significantly more beefily if that's a word, than the reference card. So you've got a full length PCB, six pin, pin plus eight pin power in, as well as the full complement of display outputs, which supports up to three plus one displays with NVIDIA surround and an auxiliary display. It uses nice fat heat pipes, and because it uses dual fans covering almost the entire PCB, you've got boatloads of cooling for all the components besides just the GPU itself. Now the MSI card has some pretty unique stuff going for it. It's got a great cooler, it includes dust removal technology, which means the fans turn backwards for the first couple seconds to clean some of the dust out of the heatsink and then they turn around the other way and cool it. In fact, the Galaxy card has that too, by the way. It has a, a, like a, a plate that's covering the entire front of the PCB, which cools the components a little bit more on the board itself and gives some rigidity to the board so it doesn't flex as much in your case. It uses, again, an aftermarket PCB, but only two six 
two six pin PCIe connectors, same outputs, all that stuff, but what it does have going for it is triple over voltage. So I can tell you guys right now that in mine and slicks real world testing results, we got better overclocks with this card than with the Galaxy card by a significant margin, and that was due to the fact that we can overvolt the GPU core, the GPU PLL, and the GPU memory to achieve some serious overclocks. We even got close with our max overclocked power edition card to our max overclocked reference 670, because if you guys don't know this already, Kepler 660 Ti's, 670's, and 680's, unless they're using an aftermarket PCB that supports overvolting the GPU, can not do it. So at the time of publishing this video, that means unless you have a power edition, Hawk, or lightning edition card from MSI, you're not overvolting your GPU and you're probably not getting the max overclock that you could out of your Kepler. I think the conclusion for this one is pretty cut and dried. So there's a few different ways to look at this. You can look at this in terms of if you have bought the last generation card and you're a similar type of customer. So you bought a 560 Ti, you wanna know is the 660 Ti worth the upgrade? The answer is actually very simple. So we tested Crisis 2, Witcher 2, Battlefield 3, Metro 2033, and Skyrim. Some of the most demanding games out there. We ran them at 1080p with at or near the highest level of details available in all of these games. And these are real world benchmarks. We did not run any canned benchmarks. The 660 Ti at stock speed doubled the performance of the 560 Ti. Now, in some cases, the 560 Ti was probably held back by its one gig of memory, but that doesn't change the fact that a 660 Ti doesn't have one gig of memory, so you're better off with it. You can also look at it in terms of what's out there in the competitive marketplace today. The 660 Ti becomes, especially if you go with a power edition that can overclock like mad, becomes pretty much the card to buy. We were able to achieve a 400 megahertz overclock on the memory which helped a lot with that cut down memory bus. That combined with the 200 over megahertz we got on the core due to being able to overvolt, put it right within range of a GTX 670, which is a significantly more expensive card even when both of them were overclocked to the max. So at 300 bucks, does a 660 Ti become the card to buy? The answer is pretty much yeah. So you got the power consumption that comes with a 28 nanometer manufacturing process, which is basically almost the same as a 660 Ti with double the performance. So the performance per watt is through the roof. You've got all of the new features from NVIDIA, including GPU boost, where you're only getting the clock speeds you need and you're using all the clock speeds you get. Adaptive V-Sync, which gives you the smoothness of V-Sync, but with the frame rates of not having V-Sync on. And I'm just gonna totally look at my cheat sheet here because there you go. Great idle power consumption. Ah, support for FXAA and TX XAA, more advanced anti-aliasing technologies, depending on, you know, subject to game uh, availability. And that's pretty much it. Another, oh, final advantage of going with a non-reference card is you are pretty much free as long as you get a high quality card from coil wine. I hate coil wine. Coil wine is that like electronic buzzing noise and both the Galaxy card that we tested and the MSI card we tested did not exhibit any coil wine at all even under intensive loads. So thank you for checking out this episode introducing the GeForce GTX 660 Ti pretty much the GPU to buy. It supports everything even like three-way SLI and it's a $300 graphics card. Oh and if you buy it right away right when it launches so anyone watching this video later not for you. You get a free copy of Borderlands 2. So that's a $60 value right there. Don't forget to subscribe to NCIX Tech Tips.